why is why do we have a need to have a vision for children and the young well doctrine is what creates vision what you believe is what you see what do you mean when you have doctrine correct theology and you see things as they really are your eyes are opened all right then when you see things as they really are from the scripture what happens you instantly have burden so doctrine leads to vision leads to burden when you have the burden of the Lord upon you it leads to compassion and compassion leads to action that's why vision is so important but you don't have vision if you don't have proper theology okay so um, let me show you and because of lack of doctrinal precision and clarity in the church for the last 30 plus years the church has had it been an absolute disaster in many areas because doctrine has been minimalized and experience has been magnified for you know many of you by now uh, when Michael does this camp and leads this camp uh, I don't know how many times I've said it is that I do not want our camp height driven I don't want it emotionalism driven I don't want it spiritual experience driven do we have those here every year yeah what do you want it Michael I want it text driven so you see, then the kids, no matter where they are, the life is in the text. So that's why I tell the preachers and teachers, stick with the text. And then I want the children and teens to have their experiences and their emotions be a response to the text. That's the way it should be. Many times it's not. I can go into a lot of youth meetings and hype them up easily if I say the right things. So that's why we've got to have this. Now, one of the things that's so important um, to have vision is you need to see children and youth in 3D, three dimensions. These are 3D glasses. I don't know if they still hand them out at movie theaters, but I've had them for years, and they're a very important illustration. Why? Is that one thing of the many reasons that keeps me ministering and wanting to be with children and weeping over children and not graduating to another age group is because I don't just see the children. When I look at the children, I see them, oh my father, in just a few years, and many of you have seen this too, they're gonna to be teenagers and hormones. And before you know it, these precious little angels are gonna be bearing their own children. And then they go into the trials and the stresses and the pressures of adult life and parenting. And before we know it, they're going to be senior citizens like I, like me. And then before you know it, where are they gonna be? They're going to be in a, in, in a station wagon with this on top of it. That's why it's very important to see children in more than one dimension. It's very, very easy to see them, right? Just at the age they are now, but vision changes all of that. Some more vision things. A quarter of the world's population is under 14. 85% of all people who inherit eternal life receive eternal life between the ages of 5 and 14. 85% of people who will be in heaven for eternity get saved between the ages of 5 and 14. Statistically, after you're 14, your chances of getting saved are 15%. That's another reason we're here. Okay? 80% of all Assembly of God ministers were called to the ministry during youth camp. Psychologists suggest that all of a child's moral values for life are determined by age five. They're the easiest age group to reach for either kingdom. Okay? Now, I was with Kim some, not that long ago, and we were in a doctor's office, and we saw, saw, saw a very old man who was sitting in the chair, sitting in a chair waiting for his turn, and he was just hobbled over like this, and I remember I leaned over to Kim and said, Honey, he was once a little boy. Do you ever ponder that, beloved, when you look at these very decrepit seniors in nursing homes, or, you know, that are on walkers or canes that are barely functional? They were once children. Very hard to think that way, isn't it? 
but it changes compassion when you view them. Now, here's another reason, beloved, that we are here. Why is it so important to minister to children and teenagers? Because based on what we said, right, that 85% of everyone who gets saved gets saved between the ages of 5 and 14. So what does that mean? We are in that precious window of their lives where they're the most receptive. But, you know, as the older they get, the window of opportunity is closing. I love what Solomon said about David. Solomon said, When I was young and still tender, my father taught me. That's another reason that we're here with children. Amen? When I was young and still tender, and that's before the evil days come. Do they come? How many of you uh, young men were children with me? After we were in Diamond Mine those years, didn't evil days come and everything? They come, don't they? I expect hardness of heart with a teenager. I never get over, I never am used to it when I see hardness of heart in a child. But it happens. So Solomon said, when I was young and still tender, my father taught me. That's why we're here, and that's what we're doing, what we're doing. And I have so many notes. I probably, I don't know, I just took out some of them. So I'm going to try to, and you know, all of you know me, I'm not a note reader. You know what I mean? I usually quote and use the object lesson. There's too much here. Now, but we also know, and I've told you this before with, with my, um, the value of the soul message. Um, we bring in an infant, right? Just conceived, just born, right? We're all smarter than it, we're all more experienced than it, we're all, more, we're all wiser than it, stronger than it. But there's one thing that we are not more than the infant who was just conceived, really, in conception. Once a human being is conceived in the womb, instantly they become immortal. Instantly. They are no less immortal than you and I are once they're conceived. So all of these precious little ones in this room, well, good, you'll say they're teenagers. You know what? Teenagers in many ways are still children. Amen? Mm -hmm. You know that because you live with them for five days, right? <laughs> you know what? Every single one of them is going to spend eternity in only one of two places. Every single person who right now is in Hades, you know, Hades is like the temporal holding tank for the wicked. It's, it's full of flames and torment and agony, but it's, it's not the state prison. The state prison is the lake of fire, which no one has ever been in yet. The great lake of fire, since Jesus created it, uh, before the foundation of the world, or when he, during creation, has been roaring, but no one has ever been in it. But when the wicked die, they go to Hades. And then after Judgment Day, Hades and death will be thrown into the lake of fire. But these precious little ones, teens and children in August, they're no less immortal than we are. That's why we're here. Now, you might want to open that side door now. <laughs> it's getting warm in here, but if you guys are comfortable. But now, um, here's a very, very important thing. This is the spiritual condition of children. Those who have a weak and faulty anthropology, anthropology, right, is the theology of man, right, always have an equally weak and faulty soteriology. What is that? That's the theology of salvation. So the weaker your anthropology is, as the true nature of man, knowing what the condition of man is and what he is, pre-fall and post-fall, many people make huge assumptions Assuming that what man was before the fall, he still is or has the ability to do after the fall. But it was a quantum leap down. But if you're weak with knowing the theology of man, you'll be weak with your salvation. Why are you pump pumping on theology, Michael? Here's why. Your theology about children determines your methodology. The stuff out there I've seen in children's ministries for years just drives me crazy. It is so cheesy or it's so... It's so uh, frivolous or it's so shallow and uh, it's it's just it's, so much of it is goofy. Well, hey, Gertie, I've seen your morning chapels at kids camp. But you know, like we said earlier, when we play, we play. 
But when you bring that goofy, flippant, shallow stuff into the ministry time, you're done. You play when you play, and you pray when you pray. Amen? So yes, we love, why do you play with them? Because we like to. It's fun. But we, like Connor was reminding us, when we pray, we play, we play. And what? We relate with them so that they're more receptive to the ministry. But your theology determines your methodology. Now, here's this, this message is basically in three parts. Here's something that we must know for these children and teenagers that come this summer. Children have already three strikes against them before they even come into the world. Strike number one. They're born with Adam's nature. By the disobedience of one man, many were made sinners. Remember? This is my one of my favorite of, of, of probably hundreds of object lessons. If I could only have five, this would be one of the five. Remember, this is what a human being looks like with sinful fallen nature. Only this. Now, disobedience of one man, many were made sinners. Psalm 51.5. This is David speaking, the man after God's own heart. Surely I have been a sinner from birth. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Psalm 51.5. Jesus said, flesh, or fallen human nature, gives birth to flesh. And I wrote this in my notes just the other day. Fallen human nature can only reproduce what it is and what it has. John 6.63, about the flesh, fallen human nature that we're all conceived with in the original sin, the flesh profits nothing. That's what Jesus said. Paul, Romans, 7, Romans chapter 7, verse 18. I know that in my flesh, in my fallen human nature, nothing good lives in me. And then another version goes, not one good thing lives in me. John 2, 24. Jesus did his first met, met, uh, miracle we were at the wedding in Cana. Right? But he said, and everybody was excited, and they were getting all excited. But watch what, watch what the scripture says. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them. The people who just witnessed his miracle and were excited about him. It says Jesus wouldn't entrust himself to them. Well, why not, Jesus? For Jesus knew all men. He didn't need man's testimony about man because he knew all men. Jesus knew what they were. Remember what he told his disciples, those who followed him. If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, he was telling that to his disciples. Why would he say that? Because he knew basically what they were from conception. Wow. What else? Proverbs 22, 15. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. Foolishness often in Proverbs is moral folly, where you know the difference between good and evil, but you choose evil. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. Proverbs 29, 15. A child left to itself brings its mother shame. Children, remember, don't need to be taught how to sin, do they? They need to be constantly be discipled and disciplined and taught and nurtured how to obey. And to be godly, you don't have to teach them how to sin. And if you leave a child to do whatever it wants, it's home alone on steroids. Right? A child left to itself brings its mother shame. Now, early, early man. Genesis 6-5. It was so cool I heard Abby share, uh, sharing it. I was perking up when Abby was sharing this text. Of course, other times too. But it was so cool because, wow, okay, it's because we're talking about that. Genesis 6-5. This is early mankind. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become. And that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. Well, well Gertie, the flood wiped that out and everything, everything got fixed. No. After the flood, Genesis 8, 21, man, every inclination of his heart is evil from childhood. From childhood. Wow. There are so many texts, I'm skipping them down. All right. Um, Galatians chapter 5, you know, we have the works of the flesh are manifest, or they're very obvious. All right. And then Paul gives a whole list, and one of them is idolatry. I've seen countless kids and teens who are idolaters, oftentimes being led into it by their parents. Now, Romans 8, 7, 8. 
We're still talking about what the nature is in human beings from conception. The sinful mind, in other words, the mind of fallen human nature that we're conceived with, is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Now watch now. Nor can it do so. It doesn't even have the ability to submit to God's law. Now watch this, Psalm 25, verse 7. This is David again. Don't remember the sins of my youth. Well, wait a minute. Wasn't David like, don't you picture David as a boy, like sitting under a tree, keeping watch over his sheep with a piece of straw in his mouth, playing his harp? Well, that's not how David remembers all of his youth. He entreats the Lord, please don't remember the sins of my youth. Now watch 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. Flee from the evil desires of adults and senior citizens. Flee from the evil desires of youth. Isn't that sad to even put those two thoughts together? Youth and evil desires. Uh, the, God, the Good Speed translation says to flee from the cravings of youth. Youth have the nature and the ability to crave evil things, not just desire them. Another word, the Williams translation says, the evil impulses of youth. Revised Standard Version, the youthful passions. I put, as my, my paraphrase, lusts that characterize youth. Now I said youth and sin, the deep tragedy of the fall of man, is that these two terms are mentioned side by side. Now, this is one of the most powerful translations I've ever seen. Flee from bad things that young people often want to do. That's called the easy read version, but it's profound. Flee from bad things that young people often want to do. And then Paul, the, the, uh, remember, I, for those of you who were here, I preached on Romans chapter 1 last summer. All right, well, at the end of that, uh, Paul gives this horrific indictment of the human race, just how depraved they were. And one of the last things he says about the condition of the human race, they were also disobedient to parents. Now, remember, adults don't have to obey parents anymore, but children have to, and teenagers do. We're to honor them always. So it's in, Paul's including young people in that scathing indictment of the human race. But then it says, all right, well, that was, that was early man. But then in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, Paul, as far as late man, Paul goes, uh, the end times depravity of men, the young were included in disobedient to parent. Remember it says, in the last days, perilous times will come. Because men will be, you know, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, disobedient, covenant breakers. You know, and Paul goes on through the list, and then he goes, he's talking about the people in the end times, disobedient to parents. So he's including youth and children in that. Now watch this. Brother will deliver brother over to death and the father his child and children, children will rise against their parents and have them put to death. That's what Jesus is talking about the end times. There's so much I wish I could read. Uh, John Murray was a theologian at Westminster in Philly for decades. And I remember I was at Elam at a conference in the afternoon we had free time. I was on a bed and, and, and funny though, a dorm I stayed at my freshman year at Elam. And I was reading his one of his theology books and I was so blown away and, and stunned by what John Murray wrote about redemption applied, accomplished and applied. I had to get off my bed and get on my face. Well, he has one of the most profound uh, exposés of uh, the nature of sin that I've ever read. But one thing John Murray goes is, is, at the point where the demands of God's glory are most manifest, at that point, human nature's hostility is most violent. So if you wonder why people in church services aren't reacting in some way, you ain't getting a clear message. As John says, the nature of sin is such, is that when you bring the clear demands of God's law and His holiness to human nature, if you did it right, it will react. And it's when it gets most violent, when the demands of God's law and holiness are most clear. Wow. There are no degrees of depravity, he wrote. There are, however, degrees of cultivation and expression. My wife, if you want to get Kim mad, just refer to the Holy Spirit, for children is always the baby Holy Spirit. Kim says there is no baby Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that we see in adults, right, is the same one that's in the children as we see here. Amen? Mm -hmm. Watch. There's also no baby sin nature. The same exact nature that Hitler and Stalin 
and all the villains and tyrants and uh, perverts and serial killers, you, that they did what they did is the same exact nature that all human beings receive at, con at conception. I'm offended, Gertie. Well, here's the key, is that there are no degrees as, as far as, well, you got a worse nature than I did. No, no. The only reason that that person did what they did is because, unlike you maybe, they cultivated it. And also, they expressed it. They let it out. How many times have you had horrific, vile, evil, murderous, uh, perverted thoughts, and everything in you wanted to do it, but you restrained yourself? Well, the people who did let it out, they had the same nature you did, except you restrained by the grace of God, and they didn't. So it all comes from the same place, beloved. And it's the same nature that will be in these teenagers this week. Now, Charles Hodge, another one of my favorite theologians, he taught at Princeton uh, and in, uh, for 56 years in the 1800s. And he was writing about the sin, sin uh, depravity and, and, and sin. He goes, the early manifestation of sin. As soon as a child is capable of moral action, it gives evidence of a perverted moral character. Not only do we see the manifestations of anger, malice, selfishness, pride, envy, and other evil dispositions, but the whole development of the child's soul is toward the world. I many, many, many times you take the average kid in America, be a church kid, and you, you put a... At the end of a table, a Bible on one side and the hottest video game on the other side. And you say, all right, Tommy, you know, go to the table, whatever you want to do. What do you think they're going to choose 10 times out of 10? Unless he's a real different kid. <laughs> he's going to choose the hottest video game. Why? Because that's all this will ever want. It never, ever wants anything that has to do with God. Now, the soul of the child turns by an inward law from God to things created, from the things that are unseen and eternal to the things that are seen and temporal. In its earliest manifestations, the nature of the child is worldly, of the earth, earthy. Now, and I want to keep going. So those were just scriptural declarations of the nature of children and youth. They were just declarations. But now, I'm going to give you more evidence as to why we are here by Practice. So we, we know by precepts, by the, by the text of Scripture, they just declared how evil the nature is that children and youth have. Now we're gonna give, I'm going to give you some more confirmation of that. Remember, we've got to know the nature of the children and teens we are working with. If we don't, remember, it will affect what we do with them. Light, shallow theology, light, shallow ministry. So watch. In the course of time, Genesis 4.3, these are some of the most sobering, powerful, potent, nuclear words in all the Bible. In the course of time. He's talking about Cain. In the course of time. And what happened in the course of time? We know that Cain one day, as a, as a young adult, or however old he was, he didn't just decide one day to kill his brother. You can tell that Cain, at probably an early age, was rejecting the godly input of Adam and Eve. Well, how do you know? Because when the Lord came, when, remember when Cain's offering was rejected? Cain just didn't decide one day to offer the fruits of the ground in an ungodly, unpleasing way to God. Something was going on in Cain in the course of time. Someone else got to him. What happened? In the course of time... You can tell he was rejecting his parents' godly input by the way that he talked to God. He didn't. Remember, God came after Cain and he gave him a personal, divine invitation and warning. Remember what he said? Sin desires you, but you must overcome it. When Cain was very angry that his offering was rejected, or that his was rejected and Abel's was... What, and it, Cain totally ignored the Lord, didn't even respond to him. This is what happens in the course of time. A child left to itself brings its mother shame. And so what happens? It says in 1 John 3, 12, that don't be like Cain who was of the evil one. So there was some point, my dear brothers and sisters, where he kept rejecting his parents' input and he rejected the Lord to his face, didn't, ignored him, but all of a sudden he crossed the line and he went to the dark side. There was no hope. 
in the course of time, I, I, I don't, maybe I haven't done it since I've known all of you, but one of the time machine dramas I've done a number of times through the years is Cain coming out of the time machine right after he kills Abel. All right? Sin desired to have Cain, and it got him. So one of the th reasons we are here, we want to be used by the Lord to get these teams before the devil does. Now, some, some other things that we know just by reading the scripture and what happened to youth and children that confirms about their nature. All right, watch. Um, there were no children or teenagers on the ark. None. Not even one. Ever heard of Answers in Genesis? It's one of the most solid, biblical, faithful to the text uh, ministries in all the world. If you don't know it, check it out. Answers in Genesis. They estimate, and they're connected with the people who built the ark, the replica in Kentucky, Ken Ham, I'm pretty sure. But watch, He's, they, they estimate from, they're constantly delving into Genesis and, you know, you know, just researching it all the time. And that's one of their main fields of expertise. But they said, um, my notes now. Hang on. 750 million to almost 4 billion people. That's their estimates of how many were on the earth. Now watch. Only eight were saved, and they were all adults. Not one child or teenager. And here's one of the saddest things. Remember when God was, was having Noah prepare the ark? Who brought the animals to Noah? The Lord did, remember? He just moved on the creatures, and they came to him. But this is sobering. God didn't move on one kid or teenager to get in the ark. It says in 2 Peter 2, 4, of God did not spare the ancient world. It says that God took personal responsibility, as John MacArthur says, for drowning millions of people. Behold, I, even I, do bring a flood. Genesis 6, 17. And remember who closed the door of the ark? The Lord did. Genesis 7, 16. Did you ever ponder, beloved, that the, 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 the Lord closed the door of the ark on children and teenagers? Very sobering. But you know, a lot of churches and teachers just get right over that. Oh, well, no, they avoid all the tough stuff. Even many curse God and get bitter and walk away. I don't want that kind of God. You know, they don't know him. Every drop of him is absolutely perfect. Every drop. His wrath, I'm, some of you who see my cab talks every week, I'm in a series now, God's adorable wrath. Every drop of it is adorable and just and holy and deserved, and it's always less than the people deserve when he gives it. Wow. Now what about Genesis chapter 19? It's, it says, all the men of the city... both young and old, from every sector of the city came to try to rape the angels. All the men of the city, both old and young, came to try to rape the angels. Genesis 19, 16. No, angel, no children or teens were safely led out of Sodom and Gomorrah. None. It says in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, that if God did not spare the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, but he reduced them to ashes. Oh God. As an example for those who would live the ungodly life that the Sodomites lived in their day, all those children and teenagers in Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain were reduced to ashes. Oh God. This is make, Michael, this is making me not want to... No, this is what makes me want to get the kids. Let me add them. Because I know that God doesn't excuse sin because it's young sin. If he does, then he just lowered his holy perfect standard to as only as holy as the kid he lets in. Wow. And I, there are so many texts I could take, and I just want to pick some out. John Jacobs was a famous evangelist many years ago in America. But he said, little Amalekites grow up into big Amalekites. Wow. 
Now, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 12 and 17. Hophni and Phinehas, they were Eli the high, high priest, his two sons. They had no regard for the Lord. Moffat's translation goes, they were worthless creatures. They cared nothing for the Lord. Now watch. They were promiscuous. They were sleeping with the women who came to church. The tent of meeting. And these two priest sons, this, these two sons of the high priest, were fornicating with the women who came to church. Irreverent, they were blasphemous, they were rotten, and yet they were religious, and they were young. Watch. The sin of the young men, young men, was very great in the, in the Lord's sight. You'll hear people say, you know, on, on, online, well, all sin is sin. No, it's not. No, it's not. If you hear people say that, turn them off. Well, all sin is sin. No, it's not. 1 Corinthians vividly says that there are sins that you do that are more serious and severe than other sins, like fornication. All the other sins you do are without your body. Fornication is a sin with your body. There are degrees of sin. And there are so many scriptures, but it's another message. But you see, even this text says that the sins of the young men were was very great in the eyes of the Lord. Why? They were treating the Lord's offering with contempt and they were young. They despised the offering of the Lord. These are young people. Now, this is a tough one that many people either walk away from God or don't want anything to do with Him. All the time, you hear it. 1 Samuel chapter 15, 15 verse 3. The Lord told Saul, kill the Amalekite children and infants. Don't leave anything alive that breathes. Now, Something you have to remember, beloved. When you see texts like this and you want to get bitter at God or judge Him and you meet that's the way human nature is, of course, it hates God all the time. But you see, this makes me love God even more. Because I'm pleased? No. Thank you, Lord. Every drop of you is pure and holy. The Lord, it's impossible for the Lord to sin or be tempted with sin. So, and you know he's long-suffering, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth. So when it gets to the point that you wipe out a whole nation, they are horrendously evil. Or several million people off the face of the earth with a flood, which was about seven miles deep. That's the depth of the Challenger Deep in the Mariana Trench in the Pacific Ocean. 22 feet over Mount Everest. They had to horrifically desert it. Now watch. The Amalekites, they were hostile to God by nature. They were totally surrounded by other kids, teens, and young adults, and adults, and senior citizens, who themselves were all God-hating, immoral idolaters, who would do nothing with these young that got killed when they, Israel was told to wipe them out, who would do nothing with these young people but feed them, instruct them, and encourage them in their wickedness. Hence, the Lord says, wipe them all out. Wow. Second Kings chapter 2, verse 23 to 25, it says, 42 youths came out, and they started jeering and showing flagrant disrespect for the Lord's man, Elisha. What happened? Bears came out of the woods and mauled them. Now, Matthew chapter 19. A rich young ruler chooses his material wealth over Jesus' personal invitation to follow him in eternal life. Remember that? A rich young ruler came to him, Lord, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Listen, he's looking right in the eyes physically of the Lord Jesus Christ. He gets a personal invitation from the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember? You know, and he told him he told Jesus how much he had done morally wise. What did Jesus say? There's just one the one thing you lack. Go sell all you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. A personal invitation, eye to eye, from the Lord Jesus Christ, second person of the Trinity. And what did he do? The sin of the young man, he walked away. He walked away. I'm just trying to pick the text that I want to get as we get to the other side. Um, children in the end times will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. So these are just biblical examples of what the scripture already declared doctrinally. These are examples of seeing it in the scripture. And times again, young people will be disobedient to parents. All right, First um, Timothy one nine: the law isn't for law; it law isn't for the godly; it's for lawbreakers, for those who kill their parents. Now watch in Revelation, Revelation thirteen verse eight: all the inhabitants of the earth will 
will worship the beast. Remember? Revelation chapter 13. All the inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. Children and teenagers. I am skipping much, beloved, but I just want to get this down. Jonathan Edwards, the most, one of the most famous preachers who ever lived, his most famous sermon, of course, was Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. When he was preaching that sermon, he was actually reading the sermon in New England. People were so terrified, they were hanging out of the pews, fearing they'd drop into hell. That's Jonathan Edwards. But he said, From henceforth I shall reckon the sins of all men as my own. So when you see things on the news of vile, you know, uh, mass murderers and all the vile things that human beings are capable of doing, Jonathan Edwards understood this principle. Well, wait a minute. The same nature that they are cultivating and expressing, it's the same exact nature that's in me. So hence, I shall consider their sins as my own. Wow. Now, Michael, you say, if children's inherent sin nature is this wicked, then why isn't it evidenced yet? There are two reasons. Time and temperature. How many of you in your own lives, beloved, noticed that the older you got, the more heinous and severe and more wicked the sins you did were? From going from stealing candy from the drugstore, right? I'm not going to call you out, right? Then you go, you can lower that music a little bit, please. Right? But you notice that the sins of thought, imagination, desires, as you age, got more severe. Romans 6, 19 says, wickedness is ever increasing. You never go from more severe sin to less severe sin. It's always the other way. So why, why do we not see it? That's, it takes time, doesn't it? Now, the other reason that you don't see the severity of the sin nature yet in children and teenagers, of course, time. They haven't had time to do it yet. Give them time, they'll do it. And the other thing is temperature. I don't know if you guys are probably too young, but uh, uh, I remember like you'd be watching a television show years ago, and all of a sudden, for like two seconds, it would say time and temperature, and they would tell you you'd see a clock and you'd see what temperature it was. And I don't probably don't do it anymore, but that's very important to remember with why children and teens don't exude as much of the sin nature as is capable. Time and temperature. What do you mean by temperature? Is that you guys all know how it works? You see certain things or you hear certain things that's how it gets into your mind if you leave it in your mind just for seconds what happens uh, the thoughts the imaginations the fantasies become a passion the passions become action and you express what started with your eyes or ears got into your mind went down to your heart and it must be expressed in the body so you give kids and teens enough time in the right situation, in the right temptations, and they it'll come out. I remember, I wish we weren't being recorded, but as a teenager growing up in South Jersey, uh, one of my relatives uh, was brought suddenly into our lives through the death of, of uh, another relative, and so they began to live with us. And even before that happened, when we would go visit them uh, in another state, this, uh, this, this cousin uh, had a, a, a father who couldn't do much with him. So this cousin was involved for his age in so much more wickedness than my brother and I, we, we knew. We just had, a, how do you say it, a solid American family. And uh, they had struggles in their family. So he introduced stuff to me and my brother that I, we just would never have done. Well, well I'd say we would never have done. But you see... It all, it, all it takes is time and temperature and outside influence to, get, to affect you. Now, another reason why don't we see sin nature expressed more? It's because of this. I haven't used this in so many years, and I wish I had. I made this uh, 21 years ago. What's the, it's a block wall. We all know that God is sovereign, and there's not, a, not an atom in the universe that's not doing what God wants it to do. If there's an atom in the universe doing something on its own, then God is not God. There's nothing out of his control. But he chooses to use means to keep it control. That's why Romans 13, uh, God could easily just squash every expression of evil in the United States while he was sleeping, if he slept. But what does he use? He uses government authorities, police, 
He uses, that's what he uses. They're supposed to punish evildoers. It says they don't wield the sword in vain. They're for punishing evildoers. Now, what else does he use to restrain sin nature? The church. Have you seen how rapidly the church is going liberal and going apostate? There were, there were bastions in American Christianity for centuries, not even decades, that are sinking faster than the Titanic. With, with, and I'm going to show you how in a minute how it's happening. Schools. We don't need to spend a lot of time, but the perversion that is being taught in schools, these were the places that were supposed to be the block wall to hold back sin nature, and they've all been falling apart for a long, long time. The things the government is not only tolerating, but celebrating and, legal, and, and legitimizing and making litigation and law, the wall's coming down. Families, I remember when I was a, when I was a baby Christian that a, that a, a one of the most famous preachers in America at the time, he said that the average, average marriage, 50% of marriages in New York City at that time ended in divorce, families falling apart. And of course, we don't need to spend a lot of time. We all know society. But these are the things that the devil's been coming at to chip this block wall down. That's why this is getting more and more liberated to express what it wants to do. It's because the devil's knocking the block wall down. So that's strike number one. That's only strike one, Michael. This next one's shorter. We're talking about the three strikes that children have before they even get into the world. Strike number two. That's strike number one, they're born with Adam's nature. Strike number two, they're born with family iniquities, weaknesses, strongholds, and sin tendencies. What do you mean? This, the theological support for this, there are two basic schools of thought in theology, like how is the soul of a human being conceived. There's the creationist theory where they teach that the mother and father, of course, unite. They create the physical part of the human being, but God immediately at conception, he creates the soul of the child. So the, the parents do the body, God does the soul. The struggle with many, many theologians with that belief is that how do you account for sin nature? If God creates the soul and then immediately it's conceived in sin, there's a blockage there. The other one that I tend to lean more to is called the Traducian theory. And basically what that says is that not only do the parents give the child at conception their physical existence, but they also, at their two, their uniting, the soul is created as well. Now, um, and this is, this is very interesting, this would seem to, to, to explain, do you notice when you look at certain children or teenagers you see so much of one of their parents or both in the kid or teenager. Now I understand by being around the parents, growing up with them, imitating their behavior, I get it. But there's something with personality traits. Um, I notice certain iniquities that run in the Girton family as I watched my, you know, my relatives and through the generations. And I was just mourning again the other day that now my dad and all of his siblings, the whole generation, that we, I was one of 27 cousins with them. And just wonderful times. We have home movies that didn't have they didn't have sound yet. It was just Super 8, you know, quiet, silent home movies, but just precious times. And now, oh my dear dad and all of his siblings and all those wonderful, they're all gone. But I also noticed, as I observed uncles and whatnot, that wow, I saw certain t sin tendencies and, and and strongholds that just seemed to characterize the Gertons. Even my knowledge of the original Gerton who came over from France and he was in Canada and his, what I know of him, it's basically the same thing. So it's like, this is strike number two, that children can also, there are certain families that look at you right in the eyes and cry and swear they're telling you the truth and they're lying to you. It seems other families, there's drunkenness or adultery or you name it, what runs through the family. Now, one famous theologian from centuries gone by, he says this whole mystery of like, how is it, how does the soul come to be? He said, it's an insoluble mystery. He goes, parents and children are somehow united into one federal body by a true tie of race. And that tie, that the tie does include the spiritual as well as the bodily substances. That divine power and human causation may both act in originating the being and the properties of the infant's soul. Now, I know this can be well over-exaggerated, but I tend to lean towards the Traducian theory, and this would explain, so in other words, if the, if the child gets its body and its soul and its sin nature from the parent, 
that would explain how they get it, and also it would understand why Jesus had to be conceived by the Holy Spirit. Because if Joseph and Mary, of course, conceived him, he'd received the sin nature from them. So what happened? Of course, we know that Joseph was not the father, so he didn't contribute sin nature. But what about Mary's egg? The Lord sanctified it. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the shadow of the most, the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so that that thing conceived in you will be called holy, the Son of God. That's why it had to be. Jesus had to be conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. So most likely, why? Because sin nature is transmitted through the parents. Strike number three. Children always suffer the most for the sins of the parents. There are so many examples of this. We already talked about this. Who ate the fruit? Adam and Eve ate the fruit. But who gets the sin nature? All of us. I didn't eat the fruit. I mean, he did it, but I get it. Yeah. Genesis chapter 12. Pharaoh, remember he saw how beautiful Abraham's wife was, Sarah? And what did he do? It says he took her, you know? And what happened? The Lord inflicted serious diseases on him and his household. So all of a sudden, the children of the teens in, in Pharaoh's palace, they got these serious diseases. Did they lust after Sarah and take her? They didn't do anything. It passed on the children. Exodus chapter 9, verse 11. Who hardened his heart at the Exodus? What? Who hardened his heart at the Exodus? I mean, I mean, what human being hardened his heart and wouldn't let the Israelites go? Pharaoh, right? Pharaoh hardens his heart. What happened? Who dies? Did Pharaoh die? Doesn't say Pharaoh died, right? It says all the firstborn. So he's the one who hardens his heart. And of course, I know later the Lord hardened his heart too. But he hardens his heart. But the, sh the firstborn die. And then it says in Psalm chapter 78, it elaborates a little more on the angel of death who went out about midnight. One of the most sobering things in all of Scripture. And I'll never forget uh, Charlton Heston when he says it in the Ten Commandments from 1956. It's like he's hearing directly from the Lord. About midnight I will go out. And the firstborn of Egypt will all die. But Psalm 78 elaborates a little bit more. It says that a band of destroying angels went out and killed all the firstborn. There wasn't a house where there wasn't a death. And the cry of Egypt, remember, went up to heaven. Wow. But who hardened the heart? Pharaoh did. Wow. And I'm, again, I'm skipping in many instances and just doing the yellow ones for you, beloved. Korah. Korah's rebellion, Numbers chapter 16. Korah and 250 men, high-ranking men, were already Levites, and they had special privilege in the, uh, things pertaining to the holy, but it says that Korah and Dathan and Abiram, they arose and they rebelled against Moses and Aaron. They challenged their authority. And may I say this, beloved, is that you look at the scripture, virtually every single coup or rebellion or, or against authority in scripture is, oh, and even in history, just look at the news, is always done by someone or some people who already have a high position of authority. They're doing just like their father, the devil, who had, was one of the highest ranking cherubim, right? In heaven? It wasn't enough. Just look at it. Just look at the rebellions in Scripture. And what happened? It says that Moses said, If these men die the death of all men, then you will know that it just was a natural cause. But if the earth opens up and swallows them and their households whole, then we know the Lord did it. And what happened? It says in the next verses, the earth opened up and swallowed them. And it says, it says, you know, Dathan and Abiram, Korah's rebellion, and the earth swallowing, swallowing alive his children and little ones. The New English translation says swallowing the toddlers. Joshua chapter 7, Achan, remember? They had conquered a country, and Achan took some of the spoils of the war. He took them and put it in a, you know, a Babylonian robe and a bar of gold, some other things. He put it in his tent and hid them, remember? Of course, he was found out by the Lord through Joshua. A Achan coveted these things, but what happened? Achan and his family, his wives and his children were all taken outside the camp, and they were stoned, and then they were burned. Who coveted the things? Achan did, but who died? Who suffered for the sins of the parents? The children did. Another one, remember David? David saw a woman beautiful bathing while he was on the roof. He should have been out to war with the other kings. 
What happened? Of course, you know what happened. He took him for himself. And what he, he orchestrated the death of her husband. And what happened? David had the lust. David had the... Uh, he should have been... He wasn't where he should have been. He had the lust. He took another man's wife, had him murdered. And what happened? And the Lord said to David, the sword will never leave your home. And it was David, remember he said, when Nathan came to him, you know, the story about the ewe lamb, that man deserves to die. And then he said he should pay back fourfold what he took. Remember what Nathan said? You're the man. And what happened? David, out of his own mouth, his judgment came. He lost four children after that happened. He paid back fourfold. How? Uh, Tamar was raped, so Ammon was killed. Then Absalom rebelled. Absalom is killed. Then Adonijah, his other son, did a rebellion, who already was high-ranking. He was killed. And then the child of adultery. Did the child have anything to do with it? No. Remember David fasted for like seven or eight days, and, and the child, the Lord chose not to, not to let the child live. So David was the one who committed the grievous sin, but the child dies. David lived a long life. Wow. These are just principles why ministry to children is so important. Now, and I can't, I just want to, 2 Kings chapter 5, I don't even remember the story, but um, Naaman the Syrian, he gets healed by Elisha, right? And so Naaman's so profusely grateful and he wants to give Elisha all these treasures. And so Elisha says, God forbid, basically, if I take anything from you. So, so what happens? Uh, Naaman leaves, but Gehazi's like, Gehazi was uh, uh, Elisha's servant. My master was too easy on this pagan. And so what happened was, when Gehazi went and chased down the chariot, and, and it says Naaman stopped, and then Gehazi said, that, you know, my master, some, of the, some from the school of the prophets came, and they decided that my master does need some things for these sons of the school of the prophet. Of course, he was lying, and so what happened? He goes back to Elisha after he hides the stuff he got from Naaman. Whence comest thou, Gehazi? No, my, nowhere, my lord. And then Elisha looks at him. This must have been so chilling. Did not my spirit go with you up into the chariot when you greeted Naaman? Is this a time for silver and gold, for vineyards and olives, and for prosperity? And so from now on, Naaman's leprosy will cling to you and your descendants forever. Gehazi had the greed. Gehazi had the deception. Gehazi's descendants forever were plagued with leprosy. Manasseh, king of Egypt, or forgive me, king of Judah, 12 years old, becomes king. When he goes up to be a, a younger man, he starts sacrificing his sons in the fire to a pagan god. Who was the apostate? Manasseh was the son's burn. All right? I'm going to do a couple more that are very famous ones. You remember Daniel's accusers in Babylon, um, in Media, where Daniel, you know, of course, he was, he was envied by these other, and again, they're high-ranking officials, but they want Daniel's position and fame and rank. What do they do? They falsely accuse him when it's all exposed. It says that not only were the accusers put in the lion's den, but who else? The young men and children, no, forgive me, Daniel's accusers and their children were thrown in the den with the lions who overpowered them and crushed all their bones before they got to the bottom of the den. Can you imagine the horror of all of a sudden Babylonian soldiers come, or the, technically they'd be Medes and the Persians, and they grab your children and teenagers. Well, maybe, what, maybe what's, going, what's happening? Because of the ambition of their father, the children die. And the last one, Matthew chapter 27, verse 25. The generation of Israel, which said that rejected the Lord and demanded his blood be on them. Remember? And you via people have seen this many times. Shall I crucify a king? We have no king but Caesar. And what did Pilate say? I wash my hands of the blood of this innocent man. And what did they cry? Let his blood be on us and on our children. Willie George, the child evangelist from years ago, I'll never forget when he said this at a, at a seminar that he, that he taught. When I was a very uh, rookie uh, kids pastor, he said that the ones who cried out his blood be us and on our children, they were most likely dead uh, when Rome came and decimated Jerusalem. But who was alive and endured the fury of Rome when under Titus in AD 70? It was the children of the people who rejected the Messiah. Wow. Now, 
And of course, we, don't, we could spend our, the rest of our time talking. These are the three strikes, as if that wasn't bad enough. But there's one more thing. On top of all of that, you have the devil's daily diet. We could easily spend an hour, could we not, talking about what the culture does to children. It's getting so vile and perverse, you don't even like to think about it. So this is the need. Three strikes of children, born with Adam's nature, born with sin tendencies, weaknesses, and iniquities that run in family lines, and strike two. Strike three, they always suffer the most for the sins of the parents. On top of that, the devil's daily diet. Uh, and again, I just wrote, physical, like Abby was saying today, physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, abuse emotional abuse, um, neglect, uh, all the stuff, that, the vile stuff that's on uh, you know, movie screens and television screens and internet screens. Um, I have uh, peer influence, um, evil influence from old, older siblings, as I mentioned earlier, or older relatives. All the stuff being taught in public schools. Uh, you've probably seen the stuff online recently, taking children to drag queen shows, and it's just, it's just pathetic. Now, this is what this is. This is the situation. Now, what has the church done in the light of this horrific situation? What has the church done? Well, they've done the babysitting method. I've never seen a kid get saved by a babysitter, unless your babysitter's an evangelist. <laughs> Right? How many churches resort to babysitting? Number two, the do nothing method. You do, oh, well, just do nothing. But if you do nothing with them, the devil will do something with them. Uh, how about the on ice method? Well, 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 the kids are pretty young. We'll put them on ice and just wait a few years, you know, and then we'll start doing something with them. You put them on ice, the devil puts them on fire. Right? These are, the, these are things the church has done that fail. What about the entertainment method? That's what I was saying, referring to earlier. Some of the stuff I've seen with children's curricular programs that they're doing, it's just like, good grief, I could see this a much better job just watching a show on TV. It's like, just some of the stuff, it's just so embarrassing. And it's like, no, no one ever gets saved by getting entertained. Well, Gertie, I've seen your morning chapels at Kids Church. Again, right? Um, we play with them in order to pray with them. So entertainment doesn't do it. And yet... The church with adults, too, is drunk with entertainment. I don't know if you saw it. I'm going to say it. The Christmas Eve show by Hillsongs a few years ago. You see that on an air, on, in, online? It, was, it looked like an Ike and Tina Turner review uh, show, and they were dancing with very skimpy girls, and the main singer had a very short skirt, and she said, Sad in the night. It was, it, was, it was insane. And it, was, they weren't, they, it wasn't a spoof. It's online. This is a Hillsong's Christmas Eve show. I wish I didn't tell you that because it's, it's pathetic. That's just one of many, many examples of the nonsense happening in the church. So what are we going to do? Moving right along. Remember, there are tons of pages. All right? What did Jesus do with children? He healed them. He cast demons out of them. Remember it says in Luke chapter 9, when he came down from the Mount of Trans Transfiguration, they were met... Uh, by, the, the, by the father said will you please have your disciples cast? I, I tried to get them to cast this demon out of my son and they couldn't do it and the boy, it was a boy it's not one of the saddest thoughts in all of scripture that there was a demon in a boy the weakest demon is more powerful than thousands of human beings and you have this totally depraved evil entity, spiritual being and he's inside a child it just kills you Jesus cast demons out of children he raised the dead. Little girl, I say to you, arise. John chapter 4. John chapter 5, verses 40 and 43. He fed them miraculously. He taught them. And we're going to talk about bringing the children to Jesus pretty soon. It said, Jesus, children's need of the fivefold ministry. So children need teaching. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. Paul told Timothy, from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures. Probably when you were children, there was a camper here many years ago, and he knew the whole Star Wars script by heart. The whole script! And he was walking around the camp, the kids' camp, and he was just quoting it. And, oh, cool, look at this. Hey, Gertie, come here and listen to this. And I started to listen to him, and I have to admit, wow, that's pretty cool. But when I thought about it, thought about it down the road of life, I thought, oh, Father, this kid can quote the whole script of a make-believe fantasy movie that has nothing to do with eternity. But Paul told Timothy from infancy, from infancy, he has known the Holy Scriptures. 
This is why it's so important that children and teens be teaching. And this is the quote that I started the message last summer that just, just still crushes me. That, that woman, Frances Kemble Butler, remember? She was the woman on the, sh on the ship that was out at sea centuries ago. It looked like the, the ship was going to go down and she was going to die. This is the thing that just keeps bringing me back to last year's message, and I put it in this message. Remember what happened? I said, this is the main reason we're doing camp. And she thought she was about to die. She said, I, I should find it impossible adequately to describe the vividness with which my whole past life presented itself to my perception. I didn't see my whole past life as a procession of events like childhood, adolescence, middle age, a senior citizen. I saw my whole life in one instant. What? And she's, what did she say? It was like held up to me in a mirror. And then she said, it was indescribably awful, but it was combined with a simultaneous, acute, and almost despairing sense of loss and waste. Remember what I told you last summer in this room? What's the main thing kids and teenagers do if left to themselves? They waste their lives. And Frances Kemble Butler, when she had, at the second she thought she was going to die, she said, my whole life is loss and waste. But watch, she said at the same time, I involuntarily, with all this like, I'm about to die, and I saw my whole life as a waste, she said, was followed immediately by a rapid survey of the religious belief in which I had been trained. And which then, at the point of her death, seemed to me my only important concern. You know how much children and teenagers are into anything but the scripture. Because the world is just stuffing them with all the latest, you know, zing zang zo, anything that can mesmerize them and get their eyes and their ears. But this woman, when she was about to die, only then did she realize at that moment, the only thing that made any, any that only mattered to me was the religious instruction I had been given. That's why we're here. That's why children and teens need to be taught. Now watch this one. Aristotle, all who have meditated on the art of governing mankind have been convinced that the fate of empires depends on the education of youth. We're seeing that in America as America goes down. Where, how did it get to where it is now? They got in the schools. The fate of empires depends on the education of youth. Watch what Martin Luther said. I am much afraid that schools will prove to be great gates of hell unless they diligently labor in explaining the holy scriptures, engraving them in the hearts of youth. I advise no one to place his child where the scriptures do not reign paramount. Every institution in which men are not increasingly occupied with the Word of God must become corrupt. Welcome to America. Now, that's why we teach. My son Matthew, uh, he's been pastoring in Cleveland. Well, he, he's with this church group called the Harbor Network. And when he was... How do I say it? In the process of becoming one of their church planners, this is what one of the leaders said to him. Children's ministry is the heaviest, weightiest, biggest challenge we face in planting churches. 1 Peter 5.8 Be sober, be vigilant, be on the lookout. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, roams about like a roaring lion, right? Seeking whom he may. Is the devil allowed to devour anyone he wants. If you sat under me and say yes, you, you weren't paying attention, right? If the devil was allowed to devour anyone he wanted when he wanted, there wouldn't be a single human being left. With his power, he could just, he would take all of us to hell instantly. He's not allowed to. He's not even allowed to think about you without God's permission. If it'll bring him more glory, if it'll be make you more like Jesus and be for your good. So who is he? Remember, it says the devil's looking for someone for, to devour. In other words, he can only devour those whom God gives him permission to devour. Got to remember that when you read text. How does he devour people? He's not allowed to take anyone he wants. Only when the person with the dealings and the grace of God and God decides they have gone past the limit. All right, you can have that one. That's why he's looking for whom he can devour. Because he can't take anyone without they've crossed the line of grace, and we don't know when that is. So how does the devil, does anyone know what the devil's favorite occupation is of all the things that he does? Um, do you think it's demon possession? Huh? 
Probably not demon possession. How many of you in your life have seen someone actually possessed with a demon? It's very rare, isn't it? Very rare. All right. Even in the scriptures, it's not real, real common. Well, the devil has bigger plans to see people damned than possessing a few people. So that's not the way he does it. Well, what about Ouija boards? No. I can't remember seeing anyone use a Ouija board since I was a teenager growing up. Oh, it's not Ouija boards. Uh, what about witches and covens? Because they're out there, I know. Church of Satan. No. Not a whole lot of people go to the Church of Satan, right? What's the greatest way by far that the devil uses to make people his own? And I have had this thing for many, many years, well, quite a few, and I've never used it. This is the first time, and I'm scared to death of it. I was so afraid one of you were going to look up, look, touch my object lessons, which you know you're not supposed to do, and you'd have to go to Walter or probably the hospital. But you know what that is? It's a rat trap. Much bigger and more powerful than a mouse trap. How does the devil trap people? Jesus told us how. Matthew chapter 7, right? Verses 13 and 14, he said, Strive to enter by the narrow gate, right? Because, narrow, because broad is the gate and wide is the gate that leads to destruction, and many are those who find it. And he said, But straight, narrow is the gate and straight and hard is the way that leads to life, and few are those who find it. The very next verse after he talks about few are going to heaven, most are going to hell. What's the next thing on the Son of God's mind? Verse 15, beware of false prophets. They come to you, YouTube, TikTok, you name the venue, that's how they get to you. The devil's favorite occupation by far to trap people is to teach. That's why it's called, beloved, doctrines of demons. The devil would much rather be in a pulpit than he would be in a brothel. He wants seminaries. He will trade, he will trade in a second from having a whorehouse to getting a seminary. You get the pulpit, you get the people. So that's, what does he do? How does he do it? Gets people by teaching. Now, young people have no idea that they listen to sermons every single day for hours at a time. Oh, I don't go to church, I don't watch any of that Christian stuff. No, no, no. Anything you watch and listen to, you are being taught. You're being taught. No, I don't like preachers. Yeah, you do. You watch them on TikTok, YouTube, whatever the venue is, they're all over the place. And you've got all kinds of people saying all kinds of things that have nothing to do with the scripture. They don't acknowledge God. They don't reverence God. They should not be on a venue or a format because they have no idea what they're saying. And many of them have millions of followers. And those are the kind of people the devil loves and loves to use. See, that's how he gets people to follow his vain and hollow and empty and deceptive philosophies by teaching. That's how he gets people in their traps. With poison and false doctrine, anything that goes against the text of Scripture, you guys know, he loves. Did God really say? First words to Jesus when Jesus is in the wilderness, if you are the Son of God. And what did the devil do trying to get Jesus to sin? He quoted Scripture. He was teaching. And so these kids have no idea how many sermons they listen to every single day. Wow. So... That's what we're trying to do here with the inculcating the Word of God in them. We're almost done. You're doing very well. Thank you for your patience. Last text. What do we do with them, Michael? Um, ben, will you come up here for a second? We prefer Benjamin, right? The three syllables. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to put this on. All right. All right. Here's what we're going to do this week, and here's what we're supposed to be doing. Who's Ben supposed to be? Thank you. Okay? So watch. So what are we going to do this week? It says in Mark chapter 10, it tells us what to do. Thank you. We're Sorry, uh, we're going much later than normal. This. All right. It says, bring, they brought the children to Jesus. 
Now, we can't bring these children, these teenagers, to Jesus physically, right? Um, of course, because Jesus isn't here physically. But the, but the definition of the word when you bring is to bring into the presence of someone. How do we do that? Jesus isn't in the room physically, is he? But how many of you keep coming back here because his presence is all over the place, right? So when we're in here, that's in a very real sense what we're doing. But how are we doing it? Like, we don't see Jesus standing here like this physically. All right, Lord, here's, here's three of my campers. They really need you, and you bring them to you. Well, we can't do that. But 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it says how we do it. Uh, the devil blinds the minds of unbelievers. Now, watch now, that they might not see the light. And what is light in Scripture? Light has to do with truth. With the way you see light. I see the truth, the way things are real. They not, might see the light of the gospel. What's the gospel? The gospel is a message. A message is made up of words. They might not see the truth of the message, a bunch of words, preaching, teaching, all right, of the perfections of the glory of Christ. That's how we bring the kids. Thank you, bro. That's how we bring the kids to Jesus. Like, that's how you see Jesus and know him better, is by that principle. The text of Scripture illuminated by the Holy Spirit. That's how you bring them to Jesus. And then what does it say? We brought, they brought the kids to Jesus so that... What's the purpose? What's the motive, Michael? Why are you and your staff doing this? So that he might touch them. That's why they brought the kids to Jesus in his day physically. It says they brought them to him so that he might touch them. Well, once again, we don't have Jesus physically here. But watch what the Greek means. You To touch with the implication of relatively firm contact. Do you notice, dear ones, that when, by the end of the week and even before that... Your kids are so much more clinging tightly to him as they've been brought to him morning and night for five days. So we are bringing them to him by the word and the spirit then because we want them to be touched by him with firm contact. That's why I chose static cling in 2014. I wanted the campers clinging to him in a static way, nonstop. Now, Jesus told them three, and then it says, what's another reason? It says that Jesus, um, he put his arms around them as an, as an expression of affection and concern. The major goal of kids' church, sometimes a kid won't remember a word you said, but they'll remember that you hugged them. When kids go home from kids' church, or when your campers go home from camp, what do you think one of the main things that they talk about? You know, Mom, oh, my dear, it's like, wow, Gertie, but man, his exegesis of that text was just like, like the way he pulled the Greek out of that, and, the, you know, the henna clause, and then, you know what they do? When they go home to, from camp, do you know one of the biggest things they talk about? Is you. Oh, Mom, I love my counselor! And they name you, and they start to tell them all the reasons why. That's why you're here. Now, by doing that, by bringing them to Jesus, and remember, you've seen this many times, you're going to see it again because it never changes, right? The, wor the words of the wise are like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd. This is why we, morning, noon, and night, these kids are getting the word. Morning chapel, cabin devotions, you just chatting with them, Amen. Evening chapels, purity talks, given by one shepherd. Beware of anything in addition to them. How do they get driven more at camp oftentimes than regular everyday life? Well, we have more time, don't we? Holy Spirit has more time because we have those long periods of time in the Lord's presence. And that's what drives the nails deeper. So when, And what's going on? Well, with the Holy Spirit moving like that, when the Holy Spirit's moving like that and the Word of God is getting driven into them, what do the campers become like to us? They're our little eggs, aren't they? Do you notice that the more the week goes on, the more you bond to them? And you become like that mother hen, you know, over your campers. They're yours. 
you know, you're responsible. First, in the beginning of the week, because we tell you you have to be, but then all of a sudden, right, the bond starts happening. They trust you. They open up to you. You minister to them. So that's what happens at week in five days, is that Tel Hai becomes an incubator for them. Amen? They have the warmth and the light. Remember how we don't tolerate any, any member for many, many years? We say, we get on the kid's case. We don't speak anything unkind. No criticism. No bullying with the lips. You know, because we want it to be a warm, safe place where they grow. So what happens? We are their shepherds and shepherdesses this week. They get more intense shepherding, many of them probably, this week than they do the rest of the year. Well, what are we doing, Gert, when you do that? Here's what. One of the first things that we do is that we harvest them. When they have this thing going here, do you ever notice how much more receptive they are? And how many kids and teens have given their lives to the Lord? Why? It's because of the incubator effect is the presence of the Lord and the word of the Lord is so warm and, and they, they trust us. They're secure. And what happens? Jesus gives us teenagers and children through the years and we have the privilege of harvesting them. Then what happens? Then we all start, start laying blocks of biblical foundations. Have you noticed through the years that these campers often are getting more solid doctrine and theology than many adults are? Have you noticed that? Isn't because we're wonderful? But the seeker-sensitive movement has done absolute damage in the church for 30 years. So the stuff the parents are being taught, so the children and teens, they're getting, they're getting this doctrine. Now, if you do this, and you do this, it's impossible not to do this. Is there anyone in the room who has not known warfare while you've been at camp? Let's see. We do this, we do this, we do this, we shepherd, we're driving the nails in, we're going to have warfare. 